I'm changing my message today. Uh, you can read on in chapter 2 of Second Peter, delivering the godly out of temptation, but it deals with false teachers, heresies, and so forth. We're seeing a lot of that today. Ironically, as I was driving in this morning listening to the pastor at First Baptist Church, Powell, he was preaching on that very subject. And he was talking about doctrine is important, and you need to learn doctrine as children and young people, and even as adults. But today there's something that's been on my heart ever since the Southern Baptist Convention. The theme is not anything unique to me, and we'll kind of explain that as we go along. But I want you to think about this phrase, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. For me to live is Christ. That's my life first, Philippians 1, 21, and I've shared with you before, there's this little ceramic piece that my mom has on the wall at our house that says that. Someday I'm going to get it, not worth much, but it's worth an entire life to me. But you know, so often as I would quote that verse, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I wouldn't use that last part, to die as gain. And we're going to deal with that subject today and how the two need to be balanced together. He said, I was in my early 40s with a lot of life before me when a moment came that stopped me on a dime. And I spent most of the next days looking at the x-rays and talking about the options, talking about sweet time. And I asked him when it sank in that this might really be the end. How it hit you when you get that kind of news. Man, what'd you do? He said. And the man said, I went skydiving. I went Rocky Mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And I loved deeper and I spoke sweeter and I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. And he said, one day I hope you get a chance to live like you were dying. He said, I was finally the husband that most of the time I wasn't. And I became a friend a friend would like to have. And all of a sudden going fishing wasn't such an imposition. And I went three times that year I lost my dad. And I finally read the good book and I took a good long hard look at what I'd do if I could do it all again. And so, this was a man who'd been told, your time on earth is limited. And that's when he said, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu, and I loved deeper, and I spoke sweeter, and I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. And he said, one day I hope you get a chance to live like you're dying. You're old enough to die the minute you're born. I want you to think about that today. It doesn't matter if you go to a doctor, you go somewhere and they come in and they say, you got one week to live. You got one month to live. You've got one year to live. Your life changes. There are people in our church who have heard those very words, three months. Four months. Has their life changed? Some it has changed. But I want us to think about that today. You know, in my mind, I think about 40 days. Christ fasted 40 days. Uh, Elijah fasted 40 days. Moses was on the mountain 40 days. It was 40 days that Jonah went to the most wicked city of his day and preached, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That wasn't an expository message. <laughs> he basically was saying, You people need to repent or else. Forty days is about six weeks. Six weeks is about the time it takes you to overcome a habit and to develop something good in your life. And so I think forty days. What if you had forty days to live? 
Well, the Bible says, teach us the number of our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom, Psalm 90, 12. And the Bible's already said, whether you've got 40 days to live or 40 years to live, you need to number your days. You need to look at every day. You need to look at every week. You need to look at everything you do and realize you'll never have that opportunity again. It could be a missed opportunity. Maybe you did it right and you can thank God for it. But do you realize what happened yesterday will never happen again in your life? And so we need to live every day like we're dying. We need to live every day like it could be the last day that we have. Let me read from the book of Philippians. Verse 12 of chapter 1 of Philippians. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advancement of the gospel. So that it is, has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. You know, Paul was jailed when he wrote this to the church at Philippi. Most of the brothers in the Lord have gained confidence from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the message fearlessly. Some, to be sure, preach Christ out of envy and strife, but others out of goodwill. These do so out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely seeking to cause me trouble in my imprisonment. But what does it matter? Just that in every way, whether out of false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Because I know this will lead to my deliverance. Through your prayers and help from the Spirit in Jesus Christ, my eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always, with all boldness, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. He said, I'm not going to give up. Paul was almost killed three times for the cause of Christ. He suffered many other times. He was at a point in his life, he was kind of thinking, man, I just soon go to heaven right now. But he said, Lord, if you want me to stay around for a little longer, I'm willing to do that. I can't get over a statement that K. Arthur has made. Kay's been around a long time. I'm not going to get, give an age or even attempt. <laughs> but at the recent uh, women's conference that a group of our ladies went to in Atlanta, Kay Arthur said she was at the point she could retire and thinks about it. But she says, when you're in a war, it's not time to retire. I'm going to tell you, we sung about the battle. They sang about the battlefield today. We're going to be in a war until the rapture of the church. Just get ready. We're in a war, folks. It's a spiritual war. It's not, it's not flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers that we're dealing with. So Paul said, Lord, if you want me to stay alive, I'll stay alive. I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you since I am persuaded of this. I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your advancement and joy in the faith, so that because of me your confidence may grow in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Just one thing, one thing, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Living like you're dying, well hopefully Number one, there's not a lot you would need to change in your life. Amen? Folks, if you live like you're dying, you're going to give God your last breath. And you're going to keep giving it for Him until you have your last breath. Give Him your last breath by professing your faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior if you haven't done that. And then if He's your Lord, stay true to Him by not turning your back on Him. Stay in Christ. Lean on Jesus. I really believe if I had 40 days to live, I wouldn't know anything else to do than to lean on Jesus. Number three, let your loved ones know what they mean to you and let others 
know too who have touched your life and make the most of every moment in your relationships. And so if you live like you're dying, let people who've made a difference in your life know about it. Number four, lift up in prayer your sick loved ones and unsaved loved ones. Pray longer and pray harder. You know, Paul said, I know, verse 19, I know this will lead to my deliverance through your prayer and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But my eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but now as always with all boldness, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or death. Paul wanted to glorify God dying. He wanted his life to count. And he wanted to keep witnessing to anybody that he could up until that last breath. Then listen as much, even more, than you talk. <laughs> God gave us two ears and one mouth. That ought to tell us something. Listen twice as much as you talk, or at least work at it. Try to do that. I was reading the other day Proverbs, and sometimes this one isn't one I've used before necessarily. But Proverbs 13, 3 says, He who keeps his mouth keeps his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Just basically saying, be careful what you say. I've heard this used of uh, Abraham Lincoln, but the other night somebody attributed it to someone else. But Proverbs 17, 28, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he who shuts his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. I bought it years ago when I was in college, a little plaque, lost it now, but it was attributed to Abraham Lincoln, sometimes it's best to remain silent and thought a fool than to speak up and remove all doubt. <laughs> and see, that was a play on Proverbs 17, 28. But listen, be careful what you say. Make sure the things that you say will count for the cause of Christ. Number six, look for the good all around you. Never lose the wonder of it all. Years ago, my secretary at Dixie Lee, Ella, her brother was dying of cancer. He lived across the road from her. He had a farm. He had cows. He had a couple of bulls. And Ella had to start taking care of his cows and his bull before she'd come to work each day. She had a bull named Buck. I'd always ask her, how's Buck doing? You know, oh. But I remember something very simple she did when her brother was near death that just made a world of difference to him. She came in one day, and she was a little later than usual, and she was telling me, said, I got, said Woodrow, I think was his name, said he had been staying with her while he was dying. So she got him to put on some clothes, put him in the car, drove a few yards from her driveway over there to their farm and just sat there and let him look at his cows she said that just tickled him to death and then she goes oh that's not a right way to put it <laughs> you know but he, he just she said he just enjoyed that getting out for a few minutes in the car driving across the road and just looking at his cows look for the good around you never lose the wonder of it all then number seven, of course, verse 15. I think Paul's a man. He says, some to be sure preach Christ out of envy and strife, but others out of good. He was basically saying, man, look for the good in everything you can. There's plenty you can look for fault for, but look for the good. Number seven, laugh frequently. A cheerful heart makes for good medicine. Amen. I can tell you some stories that I've heard from church members in the hospital that have made us laugh. I couldn't tell in church. Not really just anything that bad. It's just some personal stuff that I don't think would be, you know, we shouldn't share in church. But that's one of the best ways when someone is critically ill or something's difficult in someone's life, laugh. Paul talks about rejoicing there. And for the advancement and joy in your faith, people who are joyful laugh, don't they? 
They smile. They laugh at the worst times. I don't know if Brandon had to get up and leave because he got tickled at what I said a minute ago. But he probably couldn't contain himself or maybe he's heading on. That's okay. You ever been in church and something made you laugh? Well, it's probably better at times to go on out in the hallway and get out of your system and come back. But I was thinking years ago, there was a man who was our local grocer, and we could walk to the grocery store from our house. He and his family went to a sister Baptist church. I went to high school with his son. We graduated the same year together. And his son Howard was a nut. Fun guy to be around. He was one of these that he bought him a police car used police car when we were seniors in high school one day he took me home from work and he floored that or from school and he floored that thing man it was a police car it had one of those lights in it didn't have the red light on top but one night there were a few of us in Howard's police car and we went over to Audubon Park where as some of you folks you'll know what I mean they went to the submarine races and uh, as we were there that's where couples gathered you know to be alone I remember when we would see a car that we recognized as one of our friends, Howard would come up there, turn on that police light, and shine it in their car. We had more fun that night. We laughed out of all that because it scared them for a minute, you know. That's the kind of guy Howard is. I hadn't seen him for years. And his dad developed Lou Gehrig's disease. I was pastoring the church where Howard's dad was a member. Close friends, close family friends. He went through some critical surgery that it was one of these, he may not make it. But if he did make it through, it would buy him some more time because, you know, the Lou Gehrig's disease is not something they found the cure for. I remember that day at the hospital, Howard got to telling stories. There were about 20 people there in our group in the critical care waiting room. And he got to telling stories that got us laughing you know, till we cried. Matter of fact, the attendant had to come over and ask us, if we don't calm down, we need to leave the critical care room. Well, you know what was one of the enjoyable things about it? Mac came through and lived a couple of more years. But I remember when I went up to his room and he was cognizant and knowing what was going on, I said, Mr. Mac, Howard was there today, and he just kind of shook his head. <laughs> I said, you won't believe this, but while you're up here and you're going through this critical uh, surgery, we were all down there laughing. And you know what? His eyes got a gleam in it. He loved it to think that even in, in a difficult time in his life, we still were able to be there as Christians and have joy. Don't make people think, boy, they, they come and say, hey, how they love to see you. Next thing you know, they got a knife in the back getting ready. You know, be genuine. Love unconditionally. There are going to be people who you love unconditionally who someday it's going to come back in a great way of a reward to you. Number nine, lead the lost to Christ. We only have two more, this one and one other. Lead the lost to Christ. Philippians 1.13, so it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul wanted to be arrested. We can't go through the whole story today. But he made this statement, I appeal to Caesar. His goal in life was to witness to the most powerful man in the world at that time who was Caesar. And there came a day where he witnessed to Caesar. No record that Caesar got saved. But you know what it says right here? We read it elsewhere. People in Caesar's household got saved. Soldiers who were part of that got saved. Amen? So whatever life throws at us, the one thing we ought to make a key is to lead the lost to the Lord. The Bible says we are ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20, when you get saved, you become an ambassador. It doesn't matter who you are. You're Christ's ambassador to take the gospel to the world. And as a result of all this, hopefully there's not a lot you need to change in life. 
Give him your last breath by giving him your all now. Let your loved ones know what they mean to you and others who have touched your life. Make the most of every moment in your relationships. Lift up in prayer your sick loved ones and unsaved loved ones. Pray longer and harder. Listen as much, even more than you talk. Look for the good all around you and never lose the wonder of it all. Laugh frequently. Love unconditionally and genuinely. Lead the lost to Christ. Number 10, you will leave a lasting impression worth passing on. Leave a legacy worth passing on.